And one of the things that, you know, and I can't talk about it much because some of the nicknames that I learned in the Navy, <laughs> they're, they're not the kind that you can kind of repeat. <laughs> but over the course of the years, what happens is I've learned, I've learned to just give to just give people nicknames. And a lot of times I don't call you the nicknames I give you. What I do instead is I use them when I when I pray for you, when I talk to God, you know? And so like, for instance, oftentimes when I refer to Miss Julie, I, I just refer to movie star because she looks like a movie star to me, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. And when I pray for Hector, I sometimes, I pray for GQ. Because he used to, he used people don't know this, but he used to be a model. Yeah, like he was in magazines, and I mean, you ought to see. He he, he was Lash. you know he was the guy, right? And and Jaquan, I I just call Juan because that's he gave me permission, and so that's you know. And so the thing that's interesting though is that you know most people have some sort of nickname that somebody gave them. And it normally has something to do with the past behavior. Do you know what I mean? So, like, for instance, I was with Julie and Coach George, and we were at the gym at Fort Meade. And I was next to Julie, and she was going to town on some sort of painful machine. And I was <laughs> watching her because that's what I do. I watch. <laughs> And as we're there, and Coach is like on the other side of the room, I don't know, lifted a million pounds or something. <laughs> and from somewhere back over here, I just hear someone go, Hammer! And I was like, what? You know, and at first I thought, oh, is maybe MC Hammer? I don't know. And, and, and then they yelled again, Hammer! And I turned to Julie and I was like, is this like an army thing or what's the deal? And she goes, oh, no, they're just calling Coach George. And I looked over and sure enough, the fellow would have been yelling hammer. He was standing next to George and he's shaking his hand. And before he was known as Coach, he was known as Hammer or the Hammer. Now, my understanding is it has something to do with how we played on the football field. And I have since then, I've met a handful of people who still call him Hammer. And so I just, I, I say that because what's interesting about that is as I was reading these last few weeks while I was gone, I read about another guy whose nickname was the Hammer. And I thought, no way, Coach George isn't that old. <laughs> and because this guy is like from 2000 years ago, right? And so anyway, so I read up on this guy. And sure enough, he is known. His name actually is Judas. Judas Maccabee. Mm -hmm. And he is one of five brothers. But he is known throughout history books as Judas the Hammer. In fact, have you ever heard of the Jewish holiday called Hanukkah? Mm -hmm. It's named after, it's, it, they celebrate Hanukkah because of this guy, Judas the Hammer. Now check this out, it was about, um, uh, uh, let me see, I guess it was about one, 173 BC, so we're talking like 2,400 years ago, right? Now, the Greeks had conquered all of Israel and the Jews and Jerusalem, and Jerusalem uh, was where the temple of the Lord was, and after Alexander the Great dies, there's this group of rulers who come along, and there's this guy named Antiochus the Fourth, right? Now, he thinks he's something, and so he refers to himself, he gives himself the name Antiochus Epiphanes, which means he thinks he's some sort of revelation, you know, like he's really the bright spot in all of civilization. And so 
Antiochus decides that he doesn't like Jews worshiping the creator God. And so he conquers the city. And then uh, after he conquers the city, he takes and he, uh, he desecrates the temple. Now, I don't know if you know basically what that means, but you see, he, uh, he comes along and he totally dishonors the temple and everything that's in the temple. I don't know if you're familiar with the temple in Jerusalem, but here's the deal you need to know. The temple in Jerusalem, it was built by King Solomon the first time. It was rebuilt by Nehemiah and some other guys. And every time it was built or rebuilt, they would cleanse it. They would purify it. They would make it holy because the temple was the place where God was supposed to reside. A lot of times people say the temple was where heaven and earth, where heaven and earth, the heaven where God exists meet. But actually, it's where they overlap. You see, it's where he could, in a very special way, live among his people. It was the first incarnation, if you will, but it was in a building and not in a body. And so to keep it purified uh, was to honor the fact that God lived there. But this guy, Antiochus, Antiochus, I'm just going to call him Epiphanes, straight on. This fellow Epiphanes, he he decides that he wants to be harsh toward the Jews, so he busts into the place. He doesn't destroy the temple, but he does a lot of terrible things in there. I mean, you know, stuff that we don't even want to talk about. He does in there to desecrate the place, right? And then get this: if you know anything about Jewish people, you know that they do not eat pork or pig, right? Mm -hmm. And so he takes a hog and he slaughters it on the altar. The altar of God where lands without blemish stuff are placed, that's what this guy does. And everyone is enraged. Well, there's a fellow by the name of Matthias and Matthias was a priest and Matthias had five sons, and the oldest of the five sons is a guy named Judas, also known as the Hammer. And so the Hammer starts a revolt, and it becomes a rebellion, and he leads the nation of Israel for freedom for a short period of time, right? And it uh, turns out that he's quite the warrior, and... Uh, And he's put in charge of the rebel forces, and the war rages on, and Judas led his forces with just this unmatched tenacity, and he and his brothers, they were skilled in this art of war, plus they were guys of faith, and so the hammer's most impressive victory comes in 165 BCE, or, you know, before Jesus, when he recaptures the Holy Temple in Jerusalem from Epiphanes, he leads this small, determined army against this heavily fortified temple against all the odds. And Jews, Judas and his men, they're victorious, and he cleanses the temple, and he gets rid of all the corrupt people, and he removes the idols, and he does one more thing. He does one thing that most people don't know about. One of the last things he does to cleanse the temple is he gets rid of what's called the debtor's scroll. Yes. Yeah, Different Judas. It's a great question, though. It's Judas Iscariot. And this is Judas Maccabees. So, you know, whereas. Judas Maccabee's nickname is the hammer. Judas Iscariot's nickname would be like the worm today. So <laughs> just like, or the weasel or something like that. You know I mean? All right, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so now. About 1998 years ago, 
there lived a man named Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing I'll ever tell you about Jesus is that he's the son of God. He lived this amazing life, spoke to those in poverty. He truly cared about people. He, he was always truthful. He, he lived a perfect life. It's hard to imagine. He had this amazing relationship with his father, who is the creator God. And believe it or not, Jesus and the hammer have a lot in common. Now, I know you're thinking the hammer is like this amazing warrior. What could he and Jesus have in common? Well, you remember how the hammer cleansed the temple? I said he cleansed the temple after he took it back from, from the Greeks. Um, check this out. Jesus does the same thing. Luke chapter 19, verses 35 to 38. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout the scene as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. All right, so Jesus makes his triumphal entry, which we often refer to as Palm Sunday. Have any of you guys ever been to church on Palm Sunday and had somebody give you a palm branch or a little palm frond or something like that to mm -hmm. take with you? Yep. Yeah. And sometimes what they would do is they would take it and let you... You, you would take it while it was green and you would fold it up and make it into a cross. Mm -hmm. And then you would sit it at home for a year and you would let it dry out, right? Mm -hmm. And then on Ash Wednesday, that's why they call it Ash Wednesday, you would sit that little cross on fire and you would take those ashes and you would make the mark of the cross on your forehead for Ash Wednesday to recognize the beginning of Lent, which doesn't end till Easter. You with me? Well, what they were celebrating with those palms on Palm Sunday, they were celebrating the fact that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. It was like this huge deal, triumphant entry. There are people with palm branches and they were praising God and all this sort of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this great entry into Jerusalem. It's a little different than the, how the hammer entered. The hammer entered by force, and Jesus, he enters humbly. But once he's inside Jerusalem, do you know what he does? Well, he goes, he goes to the temple. You know, all these people are getting into his being there. All these people are singing praises, and they know the story about the hammer, right? And so they're starting to put two and two together and think, this is another hammer. This is another Messiah. This is going to be the next guy who gets us free. And instead of beating the Greeks, he's going to beat the Romans, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's done all these miracles. He's, he's cared for all these people that nobody else cares for. He's done these amazing things. Maybe Jesus is the new and then check out what Jesus says in the midst of all this frenzy. He is coming in, people thinking maybe he's the next hammer, they're going to have a revolution, get rid of the Romans, all this. Listen to what Jesus says. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, Jesus began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Hmm. Talk about a downer. 
They think he's about to overthrow the people who have conquered them. He's about to take all the injustices and make it right. You know, he's going to get rid of all of the people, right? And this is that point where you kind of expect this really powerful speech from him, kind of like from Henry V or, you know, William Wallace in the movie Braveheart or Joshua Chamberlain at Gettysburg or, you know, uh, something like that. And instead he says, I wish you all would have known the way of peace. Do you know why they didn't know the way of peace? It's the reason most people don't know the way of peace. And I'm not going to give you an easy answer because you already know. Here it is. Are you ready? Jesus said, it's because you did not recognize it when God visited you. You did not recognize when God visited you. Now, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people don't recognize when God visits us, right? And he visits all of us. Believe it or not, it, it's true. I've been studying this for a little while now. And I can tell you, he really does. He visits all of us. And one of the reasons I think most of us don't recognize when God visits us is because we have spiritual ADD. You know what ADD is, right? Attention deficit disorder. I have it. I've had it my whole life. Well, it was ADHD, but now I think it's just ADD. But I'm not positive. Okay. I used to take pills the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, pills for the ADD, not just pills. Okay, I want to clarify that. Yeah, yeah. But most of us live our lives distracted. Just think about this for a second, okay? We can be distracted by our future plans. We can be distracted by our bills or our lack of money or our lack of employment or our parents' lack of employment or where we're going to sleep or what we're going to eat. We can be distracted by what we want to do next, you know, what we want to buy next, what we want to accomplish next, how desperately I want to get to the gym as soon as he stops talking next. I mean, there are all of these things that will distract us, right? And sometimes we're distracted by people, too. Mm -hmm. We're distracted by relationships. We're distracted by friends. We have arguments with people, and it's not been resolved, and it's going to hang in there, right? And get this, many of us are so distracted by who we are or who we think people think we are which is kind of confusing, but it's true. We're so distracted by, have I been disrespected? Am I being valued? That God could sit down in front of us and we'd never even know it because we're too busy thinking about everything else. And this seems to be the point where Jesus and the hammer merge back together for a minute. Check this out, starting with verse 45. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He's cleansing the temple just like the hammer did, right? He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you turned it into a den of thieves. After that, he taught daily in the temple. But the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law and the other leaders of the people began planning how to kill him. But they could think of nothing because all the people hung on every word he said. So as Jesus enters the temple, right, he saw that it had become a marketplace. Instead of a place to worship God, it was a place to sell stuff. It was a place to make money. It was a place for commerce, right? Mm -hmm. And see, the merchants, they were selling their wares. They were exchanging money and taking advantage of those who had come to worship. And so Jesus drove them out. He overturned their tables and declared that the temple would be a house of prayer and not a den of robbers. And while he was there cleaning up the temple, 
I can just see him destroying the debtor's scroll. Mm-hmm. Just think about this, okay? You come to worship the creator God, right? You come to worship God. You have to exchange your money for money for the temple. So you're going to get ripped off there because they won't accept any other kind of money. You know, you have to buy your animal for sacrifice because it's really hard to bring your animal, but your animal can get blemished on the way. It could stumble into something, and if it gets a mark on it, it's not acceptable because it has to be perfect without blemish, right? And so then they charge you crazy for that. You buy the animal, and even you do this, and if it gets, you know, and so finally, you're ready to worship God. You've done all the things you're supposed to do. And at some point, a Sadducee or the captain of the temple guard makes certain to let you know how much money you are in debt. That's what the debtor scroll is. And you think, well, why is the debtor scroll kept in the temple? Because the people who run the temple are the people that you're indebted to. And so it's like, I try to imagine today, it would be like us trying to worship in the lobby of a bank during business hours. There's so many distractions. There is no way that you're going to hear from God. And Jesus said, look, if you miss out on God visiting you, you will not have peace in your life. And so he is just trying to level the playing field so that people can recognize when God comes to visit and they experience real peace. Yeah, that's what Jesus said. He said the way of peace is to be attentive when God visits you. If you're distracted by everything else, you'll just never know when God visits you. Now here's a question for you to ponder, okay? Just think about this question. We're about to do Lord's Supper, but I just want you to think about this question, okay? If you look around you, you look at just where we are, what we've done, what you've been thinking about in these last minutes while I've been talking. If Jesus were to come in here and clean this place out so people could worship, what do you think he might take from you or me or us? Not just the stuff around us. But but the stuff in us as well. The Lord's Supper is a time for us to celebrate the fact that because Jesus died on the cross and he rose again and he ascended into heaven, when we put our faith in him, not only, not only do we have our sins forgiven, not only do we get to spend eternal life with God. But here's the best part of all. This is absolutely the best part. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside you. Mm -hmm. I'm not even playing. The Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside you, to be with you, to carry you through difficult times, to help you deal with your anger, to help you deal with your distractions, to help you deal with people who are giving you problems. To help you deal. That's part of why the Holy Spirit comes to live inside. And so for us, as followers of Jesus, we think that's a pretty important deal. And so this is what we're going to do. Minister Eric and Minister K. Men are going to join me over here. And we're going to prepare the elements. And I'd like for you just to take 